take one of the technologies we take for granted the most, our phones. Our phones are incredibly complex devices that require a huge amount of knowledge and experience to build. However, this story isn't about how complicated phones are in the sense that you might think of, but how they are in another way that most of us overlook. This story is about how this phone and yours traveled along with so many other items such as our washing machines, cars, planes, kettles, all around the world. Now, I'm not only talking about how they traveled from the factory to the shop where you bought it, or even how they got delivered to you. No, I'm talking about how each individual element was extracted from the Earth's surface, then transported halfway across the globe for refinement. Then, how this material got shipped to yet another factory to be transformed into cables, glass, plastic, and so many other materials. Then, all these materials got yet again shipped to another factory, where they would be assembled into components who in turn would then again be shipped to another factory to be assembled with other components who shared the same journey to be assembled into something uh, into a, a larger component and this process goes on and on until finally a phone is assembled and shipped ready to be delivered to its final customer now as i said a phone is comprised of thousands of components now i'll just let you, let you imagine how many component how many kilometers your phone traveled before uh, before you bought it. In a world where globalization is so embedded in our culture, transportation is an essential aspect to our everyday lives and something we don't think so much about, besides from the occasional car or subway ride. However, our transportation system is not adapted to our growing needs and has to change. The transportation sector as a whole represents more than 20% of the global CO2 emissions in the world that are rendering our planet less and less viable. Now, global warming has a lot of unintended consequences that hopefully we're all aware of, so I won't go in-depth in them. But they include partially flooded cities, reduction of food supplies, more strong, stronger and more frequent hurricanes, and a huge increase in the millions of environmental refugees we already see today. But now, we all know that the energy we have available today is limited, meaning that we have to maximize the uh, consumption of clean energy in order, to, um, in order to move towards a sustainable future. If you look at this graph, you'll clearly see that some modes of transport have different energy efficiencies. You'll also see that demand response, which is in majority taxis, has the highest energy consumption per passenger kilometer. Now, what does a car, a plane, a train, and a boat all have in common? Friction. Friction is the number one element that all our vehicles on Earth are bound to have. Friction can manifest itself in several forms, such as contact with the water or with the ground, or, as this man can barely show us, also in the form of air resistance. On the other hand, it is true that engines are getting more and more efficient with time. However, vehicle, uh, vehicles relying on fossil fuel to operate will always have a large portion of their energy being dissipated through heat. Setting the environmental argument aside for a moment, the transportation sector also has a major challenge that it will have to face, which is the combination of an increasing world population coupled with a growing middle class in Asia. By 2100, the world population is expected to go to 11.2 billion people. Now, instinctively, we assume that a growing population leads to a growth in the uh, demand for goods and services, which ultimately trickles down to growth in the, demand, in, in the transportation demand, which is true. But that's only part of the story. In reality, the real problem comes from the growth in the middle class, which translates itself into several factors, such as the rise of leisure transportation, or, as we can already see today, the growth of online shopping with features as energy inefficient as next day shipping options or even same day delivery options. As an example of this phenomena, the International Air Transportation Association projected that by 2037 there will be more than 8.2 billion air travelers. Now to put that into perspective, that's more than the current world population. This means that in only 20 years time, the world population will grow from Eight point, uh, from 4 billion in 2017 to 8.2 billion in 2037. In that, ten, in that same time span, the world population is only expected to grow from, from 7.5 billion people in 2017 to 9 billion in 2037. This means that while the number of air travelers will increase by 105% in only 20 years' time, the number of people on the planet will only increase by 19%. Now that's a crazy growth. This drastic increase has a few consequences of its own. First of all, there's the practical problems of air routes being overcrowded, which is already the case in places like China or Dubai, 
where they are constantly opening new airspaces to accommodate uh, this growing fleet of aircrafts. There's also the practical problems of planes taking up too much space, leading to a huge increase in the um, inf in, uh, infrastructure investments all around the world. The most important issue, however, lies again with the environmental impact of a growing aviation industry. With more than 2% of the global greenhouse gas emissions, the transportation sector is already a hugely polluting sector, which is only getting worse with current trends. Now, by all means, this isn't limited to the transportation sector. Cars, ships, and trains, which are all crucial elements to our transportation system, also follow similar, similar patterns. Areas like London, San Francisco, or Milan had an average commute time of over 40 minutes in 2015, which is only getting worse. This means that the average worker will spend an equivalent of an entire year over his lifetime commuting. By now, it should be clear to all of us that our transportation system has to change. And before we can go in depth and look in specific technologies, a set of criteria have to be set up in order to go towards the better options. And just as you can't expect a cargo ship to take you across town to the bar, it's also good to keep in mind that these criteria are for a transportation system and not an individual technology. To answer to all the current problems that we're faced with, this ideal transportation technology will have to be eco-friendly, sustainable, able to absorb the growing demand for transportation, and will have to be efficient both in the energy and space it will use. In today's world, though, convenience is also a major factor determining the success of any new technology. The convenience of a transportation system boils down to a few factors of its own. However, the two main ones are speed and cost. In addition of being fast, this new transportation system will have to be located in a highly populated area in order to ensure short travel times by cutting down transit time. Also, as, as for many new technologies, uh, cost, uh, co um, also as, as with any new technologies, cost is also a major factor determining this, uh, the success of this technology over um, our current transportation systems. Now finally, safety is undoubtedly the most important factor when it comes to the adoption of any new technology. The main reasons why a lot of us are scared when taking the plane, even though and we know it is statistically safer than taking the car, is because of the lack of control. Paradoxically, the direct human presence in a, paradoxically, the direct human presence in the automobile and maritime sector is the leading cause of fatal accidents. This means that the trend for autonomy will and should prevail, but it will have to be significantly safer to survive in a, um, in a market with uh, humans. From electric and autonomous cars to uh, hypersonic and supersonic planes, there are a number of new technologies that are gaining a lot of traction right now and have people working on as we speak. However, Probably one of the most controversial technologies being developed today is Hyperloop. I personally have some experience in that technology as the head of Strathloop, a student-driven initiative comprised of over 120 students building a three-meter-long pod, Hyperloop pod for the Hyperloop competition. Hyperloop technology is, in its essence, a pressurized levitating train called pod. It is magnetically propelled and usually operates in, an, in a near-vacuum environment. This pod is designed to travel at subsonic speed, meaning slightly slower than the speed of sound at around 600 kilometers per hour. This makes a Hyperloop pod about 25% faster than the new Boeing 737. And although a Hyperloop pod is not that faster than an airliner, for short routes it could potentially save a lot more time. For example, imagine you're in Glasgow going to visit a friend uh, by plane over the weekend in London. The actual plane trip itself will take you an average of one hour and 20 minutes. However, this doesn't account for the time you'll spend in transit from your home to the airport or from the airport to your friend's home. This doesn't account either for the time you'll spend in line for your security check-in, or the time it'll take to finally board the plane, or even the time it'll take for the plane to finally take off. All in all, that trip from Glasgow to your friend's house in London will take you approximately three and a half hours in comparison to the one hour and 20 minutes you'll actually spend in the plane. Now, because Hyperloop technology only needs the same amount of space to operate as a regular train station does, and doesn't produce near as much noise pollution than airports do, this means that Hyperloop's greatest advantage is that it can departure from centers of population areas, cutting transit time. 
this means also um, the time between when you enter the pod and when you find yourself at a cruising speed is also significantly smaller than an airliner because a high blue pod doesn't have to reach a cruising altitude. All in all, that exact same trip from Glasgow to your friend's house could take you approximately one hour and 20 minutes in comparison to the door-to-door -door trip by plane, which would take you three and a half hours by plane. Now, Hyperloop technology is more of a general idea than a specific uh, piece of technology. Nonetheless, Hyperloop designs follow similar guidelines, which are minim uh, maximizing speed while minimizing energy loss. To accomplish that, pods, pods usually um, operate in a near vacuum environment as close to um, a near vacuum environment. This can reach from about 0.12 psi, which is about 122 times less pressure than on the summit of Mount Everest, all the way down to 0.015 psi, which is about 326 times less air than on the summit of Mount Everest. And all this is, again, to minimize energy loss. Now, because realistically, a tube will always have small leaks, the trick is to operate at a pressure as low as possible while being able to maintain that exact pressure um, using as little energy as possible. Now, Hyperloop is only one of the new ways we could potentially change transportation. However, there are a lot of other pieces of technology, such as autonomous and electric cargo ships, which are already undergoing testing as we speak. Self-driving cars and buses, along with car-sharing services, will help cut down on the congestions we experience today on our roads and the pollution. Self-driving uh, autonomous drones could help ease the strain on our ground and aerial roads for intercity travel and package delivery by cutting down, um, by, by operating at a lower altitude than planes. Now granted, there are still a lot of unknowns regarding all these new technologies. However, it is, it, it is a priority for governments to collaborate, with in, to collaborate with the industry to be able to keep up with, um, with their progress and collaborate with them to create a legal framework to ensure the safest operation of these technologies. Now, the human race is around 200,000 years old. Only 30 years ago, the World Wide Web, or Internet, as we know it today, was created by Tim Berners-Lee. 23 years ago, the DVD was invented. And only two years after the invention of the DVD, the first module of the International Space Station was first launched into orbit. Bluetooth was created two years after we first started building the International Space Station. Most people in this room were alive when Wikipedia first launched 18 years ago, continually expanding human knowledge and saving us with last-minute assignments. <laughs> Only four years ago, the first stage of a, first, uh, of, a, of a orbital rocket was successfully returned to Earth and made a, ver a vertical landing. We are evolving faster and faster in a world where imagination of what is possible was and never will be the limit. The future is an exciting place, and we are the only ones with the power to change it for something better. Thank you.